let me once again warm welcome to everyone to those of you who've been here for a few minutes and those just joining now uh, we are here to discuss the role of auditing and certification in legislating human rights due diligence and given the great number of participants many of whom are yet to join uh, the topic clearly strikes a nerve um, the OECD guidelines, as well as the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, expect companies to carry out risk-based, proportionate due diligence across their operations and value chains. What happens in practice is that companies often outsource the implementation of this obligation to third-party operators, such as social audit and certification schemes. Now, whereas countries committing to the guidelines are continuing with the voluntary nature of their observance, some countries, as well as the European Union as a whole, are taking a big step further by adding the legal enforceability and bringing binding due diligence standards. Some of you here, or perhaps many, may have strong opinions on whether the role of auditing and certification in due diligence is about respecting rights or ticking boxes, which is the first part of the webinar's title. Now, respecting rights or ticking boxes is also the title of the briefing paper that was published last year by Clean Close Campaign, European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, Public Eye, and SOMO. And these are also the co-organizers of this webinar. And indeed, the publication is our starting point for this webinar, but it covers much more ground than social auditing and certification, and I warmly invite you to read it if you have not. We will be posting some of these links in the chat, uh, and you also could see a link um, in, the, in the invite to the webinar. If I may share my screen for a second. There we go. Just a minute. Is this visible? David, yes, I see you nodding. So this is the publication. And just to give you a sense for the breadth of topic that it covers, uh, here is the table of contents if you have not seen it. So it covers uh, various aspects of the standards and how they can be translated into legislation uh, about the contributing versus being directly linked, the prioritization, prevention versus mitigation, and so on. And indeed also you see the, top, the topic we have here is the role of auditing in certification in human rights due diligence, which is what we're discussing today. So I invite you to, uh, yeah, to read this if you have not. It brings a lot of valuable insights. Um, but for now, um, let's move on to the webinar where we will focus indeed on social auditing and certification. Um, given my role in this webinar, and because our time is short, I will not get into the details of the position of my organization, which is Clean Close Campaign on Social Auditing. I will, however, point out that we published a report on social auditing in 2019, which you're also very welcome to read. And we titled this report, Fig Leaf for fashion, which tells you where we stand on the respecting rights or ticking boxes point. But to make it more explicit, let me also share the subtitle of this publication, How Social Auditing Protects Brands and Fails Workers. But as this webinar is not about clean, clean clothes campaigns position, but about hearing from our speakers, Let's now really begin in earnest with uh, speakers who have joined us today to share their uh, views and research. We will have Aruna Kashyap, who is Associate Director on Corporate Accountability in Human Rights Watch. Joseph Wilder Amsing, who is Senior Researcher at SOMO, an organization that investigates multinationals. Elspeth Hathaway, Senior Policy Advisor at Industrial Europe. And we will also have a member of European Parliament, Lara Wolters, who will be joining us a bit later because today is the, the day when the parliamentarians move to Strasbourg. So she will join us as soon as she can. Um, and just about the webinar, we decided uh, to try to make it dynamic. So instead of opting for a series of presentations, we will have uh, short uh, interventions by our speakers. And we will also aim to to, to save at least half hour for open discussion with our participants. Uh, that said, it's really important for everyone to keep their input very concise. I might be, and I was given the 
permission to be a little brutal on this, maybe making some uh, signals to the speakers. And also when it comes to open discussion, I might uh, interject, you know, if you start going too long. So please keep this in mind so that we hear from as many people as possible. And now me keeping this in mind, um, I will immediately jump to uh, the substance um, and ask the three speakers we already have here um, to share, let's begin with Aruna, but I ask everyone the same question. I would like to uh, ask you to share with us what is the main takeaway that you would like to leave people with, people participants with, as we go into this discussion now, um, and, and the EU institutions are basically running the final laps on the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive. So what would you really like for people to impress in their memory as they leave this session? Aruna, please. Thank you. Thank you, Neva. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us and to fellow panelists for joining this conversation. I think it's coming at a really critical time. I think the two or three main takeaways. One is if we're looking at, I mean, both for companies, but also legislators and regulators. Um, one is if you're looking at what constitutes robust human rights or environmental due diligence in the value chain, then it's not social audits and certifications alone. So equating the two will actually cause more problems for companies and solve problems for them in their value chain. So that's the first big thing we have to remember. The second thing is, so if, if it's not only this, then what, what helps, what, what, what can companies do? And I think it's a smart mix of measures and the legislation should hopefully drive companies to do that, uh, which is, you know, Start the so I would call it the pillar or the foundational pillars of what would constitute a robust human rights due diligence. Starts with stakeholder consultation, have value chain transparency. So you have to know where your where your products are being manufactured and sourced from. So deeper in the supply chain and disclose it to the maximum extent possible. So join initiatives like the Open Supply Hub and make it possible. It sets you up for collaboration, sets you up for improving leverage. Then the other two key pillars I would say is is monitoring that is based on outcomes, right? So right now you sort of have indicators that you keep monitoring, but rather outcomes and closely tied to that is having grievance redress. So how, do, how does the company respond when it hears of grievances and what is the company doing to proactively open the channels of communication from affected populations to feedback to the company about how their experiences are. And I would say the other pillar is really purchasing practices. If your company has bad contracts, has does not have a system of embedding human rights throughout its various departments and including the purchasing department, then you're not gearing up for really strong, robust uh, human rights and environmental due diligence. Thank you, Aruna. Same question to you, Joseph. What's the key takeaway? Yeah, thanks so much, Neva, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, my key takeaway would really be um, this one thing that I'd like you to take with you. Um, certifications and auditing um, and, and multi-stakeholder initiatives can be a piece of due diligence, but they are not a proxy. And so a piece, not a proxy, that was the title of a report that uh, we published, um, Samuel published a couple of months ago. Um, it is crucial that in this whole effort to legislate due diligence, um, that, that the le legislators follow what the, actually the OECD guidelines themselves recommend, is that auditing, certifications, multi-stakeholder initiatives are good and can be used by companies in some situations in due diligence, but they in no way, shape, or form should be taken to be a proxy for due diligence. They should not be uh, used by uh, regulators or judges um, as, as, a, as a shield in any way for any type of liability, uh, or even as a, as a real indicator. Uh, companies must remain responsible for their own due diligence, outsourcing of due diligence um, in, in the sense of, of, uh, of enforcement and in the sense of having it be a proxy is simply a setup for failure. And so, Companies can be work with them with, with multi-stakeholder initiatives and with certifications in some instances, if it helps them in their due diligence, those, those initiatives that are effective are going to be used by companies, but they should in no way, shape or form be a, a proxy. So a piece, not a proxy. Thank you, Joseph. And Elspeth, let's hear from you. Thanks, Neva. My, uh, I was about to say good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's Elspeth here from Industrial Europe. I'm here to give the, the opinion from trade unions, and I'm delighted to see that we already have some of our members online. Um, Victor and Annalise, I can see it, and Andy, great to see you as a human rights defender. Um, for me, Neva, I take it right back to basics. 
the call for the EU legislation on human rights due diligence came from trade unions. It came from workers and it has to work for workers. We do not want this to just be a paper tiger. It needs to work in practice. Workers should be at the, the centre of this proposal um, and it needs to work for workers. Workers and trade unions need to be involved in all aspects. Not only complaints, we need to be involved in monitoring and due diligence agreements and mapping from the very, very start. And unfortunately, two of the most dreadful disasters in our sector that we know very well, unfortunately, Rana Plaza and um, Ali Enterprises, they had social audits before. So there's clear evidence there that it doesn't work. We need to make it work. Trade unions are at the heart of it. And that's what I want everyone to take away from today. We've got a great opportunity. Let's grab it by the hands and make sure it works for workers. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, after this uh, speed round, um, let's now hear from Aruna and Joseph, who both recently published um, reports or uh, briefings uh, on social auditing. We will start with Aruna, um, who published a research report uh, with the title Obsessed with Audits, Missing the Goal, Why Social Audits Can't Fix Labor Rights Abuses in Global Supply Chains. Aruna, your report brings basically first-hand accounts and summarizes first-hand accounts by those who actually do the auditing itself, which is pretty rare. Uh, could you please summarize your interviews? So what are your main findings after this research? And you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would invite everybody to read uh, the report that, that uh, I researched and wrote, which is Obsessed with Audit Tools, Missing the Goal. It's actually a direct quote from uh, a former auditor who'd actually uh, burned out from conducting audits. And uh, over the for the research report itself, um, Neva has mentioned, I spoke to a number of different auditors, quite a number of very experienced people who had, um, many of them had spent over a decade conducting social audits for uh, different sectors, including the garment and textile sector, and also looked at a lot of audit reports themselves. So it's, it was a combination of both and speaking to CSR representative suppliers and so on. And I think there are three or four big challenges that became kind of recurrent patterns. One is the entire audit industry is itself a business, right? So there there's a lot of pricing pressures and time pressures and business pressures that go into an audit. So the and one one auditor, for example, described it as a race to the bottom. So the cheaper the audit, uh, the shorter the audit, the cheaper it is, and the preference is to, is to drive down the costs. The second is, and there's also other other. Um, literature actually, because ours was qualitative in-depth interviews, but there's also quantitative uh, studies done by others who have shown that tens of thousands of audits that they've analyzed, one of the studies showed that where suppliers are paying for audits, there's greater challenges uh, in the audit result itself. And that's because there's there's a lot of pressure brought on about on the auditor and there's sort of, you know, people saying, you know, there was pressure to sort of change the audit findings or sort of keep the client happy that that dynamic enters into the into the relationship between the auditor and and the company that appoints and pays for the audit so who's paying for it who's appointing the auditor whose interests are they really protecting uh, those are sort of sort of key concerns the third the third bucket is of course audit deception because a lot of the suppliers feel uh, and this is rightly so and i say you know audit fatigue is not just a problem for the suppliers it's also a problem for civil society it's also a problem for workers because we all feel terribly fatigued by the use of, you know, overuse of audits and audits that don't deliver anything. So, so one challenge is really sort of, you know, in order to get a good audit, because then ultimately what goes into the audit finding and well, how is that remediated is central, right? So suppliers don't want a pass or fail or don't want to be caught out and then, you know, lose business, which ultimately harms workers if there's no commitment to remediation. And so in order to get a good audit, they go through lengths to try and prepare for the audit. And one auditor described there being an entire cottage industry of consultants who will uh, help factories prepare for the audit. And this is a challenge. So in some ways, sort of, you know, it's kind of a policing system which suppliers resent that it's the most cynical view I've heard of it is sort of it generates paper trails for business continuity. And that's not my it's 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 a view from the industry itself um, for people who are internally there. 
But having said that, I think one of the challenges is what do you do next? And I and I keep saying to companies, look, if you really want to invest in something, one, you have you want to collaborate, two, you want to do uh you, you want to do risk mapping in a specific country. And when there are better initiatives and far more robust, it, it doesn't even compare, right? I mean, if you look at enforceable binding agreements, for example, in Bangladesh and Pakistan on uh, health and safety, you have to join them because you can't put apples and oranges and say we're doing this, but we won't join this. So you have to sort of map out what initiatives there are in a country and you have to also innovate where there aren't any and that's where collaboration is key so for example you come to a country you realize this is a high risk let's say for example forced labor what does remedial funds look like what does a robust grievance redress mechanism look like what does paying back workers look like you know these are things that are difficult conversations but that's where stakeholder engagement engagement with experts coming up with a solution that genuinely works for workers and i think if you design something in the long term it also helps the business itself so i think there can be a, a by media but i think purely relying or using on social audits is is unfortunately not going to work for businesses Thank you, Aruna. That was a big challenge for you. And now I have, I mean, the timing. And now I have the same challenge for Joseph, mm -hmm. who recently uh, published a co-authored paper that provides an overview of failings of social auditing as an industry and points to gaps that policymakers need to address. Uh, it, the title is The Peace, Not a Proxy, as you mentioned before. Uh, now, please also take three minutes uh, to walk us through your main findings and focus on these failings and gaps. Yeah, thanks, Neva. So yeah, what we found, we did an extensive review of um, all kinds of literature over the past 10 years of the way in which auditing and certifications, and in some cases, multi-stakeholder initiatives have been used. And we really found that um, on the whole, there are lots of problems with, uh, with these initiatives and they let lots of, lots of, uh, of gaps through there. As, um, as Elspeth also mentioned, many of the biggest failures that we've seen on the, on the global scene recently have been um, have, been, have come with auditing and with certifications that she mentioned that, that we're talking here about the garment sector, obviously Rana Plaza and in, in, in South Asia, but also some of the dam disasters that have happened in Brazil and around the world have also been linked to auditing failures. Um, and so what we found was, I'll just go a minute, some of the very brief um, conclusions, um, some of the reasons behind these failures. Um, Often you find that industry, especially industry-owned initiatives, industry-only initiatives um, that includes auditing because this is an industry, um, that these are affected by inherent conflicts of interest, something Aruna mentioned too, it's an, it's an industry, right? Businesses, auditing businesses have an incentive to keep their clients happy, not to be too difficult um, in, in their audits, not to be too hard. So you really see a lot of, um, of situations falling through the cracks here. If you look overall also um, at, at industry schemes, MSIs, and, um, and, and, and third-party auditing, you see a real lack of transparency. This is a, also a very big problem that leads to a lot of loopholes. Um, many initiatives don't publish the results of their auditing or of their monitoring activities. Um, and so it, this prevents civil society, basically, or and regulators and, and external world journalists from really um, uh, playing their role as a watchdog to hold these initiatives accountable. Um, they often tend to adopt quite weak standards, um, these different auditing auditors and, and MSIs um, that are not in line with uh, international law and standards. Many of, many of the standards used by auditors and, and other initiatives are below, let's say, the OECD guidelines, for example. Um, they also operate, as Aruna uh, alluded to this, in a regulatory vacuum, that there's really a lack of real uh, accountability for these types of uh, initiatives. They sort of fall in between different things. They enable uh, actors to point towards each other and to sort of pass the buck around. Uh, this happened in, in, in Brazil with some of the dam disasters where you see now the auditor is pointing at the company and the company is pointing back at the auditor and the victims are left with, uh, with, no, uh, with no one to hold accountable. And then finally, um, these perverse incentives that are created basically by the, the auditing industry um, and the competitive nature. And this links to sort of those, the conflict of interests uh, that I mentioned just a minute ago, whereby you see uh, companies, auditing companies, competing, trying to outcompete themselves and sort of lower the standards, be the easiest one. So they're the, the company that is chosen to do, uh, to do the audits. Um, and I think many of these things are not, they're not addressed by 
um, by some of the quality standards that, uh, that, that are out there, the fitness criteria. They just simply don't look into the actual effectiveness of these uh, initiatives. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Joseph. This was great. Um, Elspeth, uh, your trade union actually co-signed an open letter uh, to European policymakers in 2021. Um, it was uh, signed by CSOs, uh, so civil society organizations and trade unions. Uh, and we all pointed out to uh, and, and asked for the EU to confront systemic flaws of private social auditing and glaring accountability gaps. So your union clearly uh, has a position on that. But now hearing from Joseph and Aruna uh, and their findings, uh, what's your first reaction to that? Is there anything that surprised you or anything that you want to react to uh, very briefly first? Thanks, Neva. Well, I think, I mean, the first thing that strikes, I think most of us will be the fact that, as we said, there's a lack of independence. There's a lack of independence. So who's conducting this and what can we really take away from it? And with the lack of independence also comes the lack of transparency. I mean, that's so concerning for us as trade unions. What, what happens with this data? Not only how is it carried out that some issues have been reported of people um, even interviewing workers in front of managers. I've got a very nice boss, but I still wouldn't like to be interviewed in front of her. So I can only imagine how other people feel when they don't even have, you know, the rights to freedom of association. Um, so lack of independence, hugely concerning, lack of transparency. And when there are issues, what actually happens? We want to see action plans. We want to be involved in that for making some making real change. So we know that what, what currently happens um, doesn't work. No accountability. This idea, as was mentioned about, you know, there being no regulatory, you know, it's happening in a regulatory vacuum. We're really concerned about, you know, how is this being monitored um, in real life? And the fact that it, it doesn't look at, as um, Aruna says, price pressures unfair uh, purchasing practices. This is something we're so concerned about um, in the trade union movement. We know that this um, can lead to issues with um, wages being withheld or forced overtime. So if you're not looking at some of the main causes of real issues, whether it comes to health and safety um, or, or um, proper um, standards for workers, they're not fit for purpose. So Big, big concerns raised in both reports. We'll definitely be sharing it with our network. And I think we've now got some really good evidence to keep taking to, to MEPs who are working on this. It's not finalised yet. We really need to make it clear as to why this doesn't work and why social audits can't be used um, to prove um, that there's no issues when we know that's not always the case. Thank you. And just because a lot of people have joined uh, in recent minutes, I want to uh, invite everyone to put your full name and your organization um, with your uh, icon on Zoom. And you're very welcome to turn on the camera and please stay on mute. We will have an open discussion later where you will be able to speak. But for now, going back to Elspeth, um, I want to ask how do their findings, so Aruna's and Joseph's uh, findings, uh, relate to what you hear from your member unions about auditing? Or if I ask it a bit differently, what might a garment worker tell us about these audits? How are they done? What violations do they find? And which ones do they not? Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, firstly, Industrial Europe, we represent um, empl um, employees in EU 27 countries and wider Europe, so including Southeast Europe. We don't include those in, uh, in South Asia, which is obviously the other big, the big uh, region. Um, for us, I think the main, the main comment from our members is, where, where are they? As in, where are the people actually going on, on to, to speak to workers or to, to that, the factory floors? We just don't have enough people, whether it's social auditors or the real you know, labour inspectors um, at national level. So I think the fact is that we always say there are not enough in the first place. And um, when we have spoken about this specifically in, uh, in Southeast Europe, the main concerns are who, who is actually conducting these audits. And of course, there is the worry that it's a social auditor who's been paid by the company the potential of they're going to twist results or they're looking for certain things be before they go in. So there's a lot of mistrust from the beginning. And in some of these countries, even in Romania and Bulgaria, countries that are in the European Union, that are real concern for workers, you know, that if you look at the, um, the percentage of uh, collective bargaining, it's absolutely collapsed in the last 10 years. Trade unions aren't as strong as they were before. There is still trade union busting going on here in, in the EU itself. People are scared. People are scared to speak up. It's something we've raised to politicians. It's something we've raised to the commission. Um, 
And it's something that we need to look at, making sure that workers can speak freely um, and that there's protection for whistleblowers. I will say, and I think it's important to remember when we look at the EU legislation, it's not a silver bullet. Yes, we need to work together to make sure it works as well as it can do. But if in countries there is still no freedom of association or there's no collective bargaining, it's not going to work. We need to have strong trade unions. We need people to protect it. Um, and of course, we need real labour inspections happening by qualified people on the ground. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an introductory round. And because we would like this to be dynamic and interactive, we made time now to take a question from the audience if there is one already. Would anybody like to ask or comment? But time is short. No questions so far? You can also type it in the chat. Otherwise, we will proceed. There's one from Sophia. Hi. Great. Yes, I didn't want to interrupt. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for this interesting presentation. Uh, based on this introductory um, um, messages that you just put, what is uh, what, what I'm wondering is that can we really trust companies that sell um, services of auditing and certification uh, based on all the issues that the presenters pose? Can we really have um, yeah a system that is trustworthy, even if it's complementary? Of course, not. Uh, not substitute of uh, proper due diligence, but even in that uh, minor role of complementing due diligence, can we really trust in companies that aim profit and sell their services? Thank you, Sophia. Who would like to respond to this? So can we really trust the companies that are basically making profits out of selling these services is my short recap. Who would like to take it? Well, I think, I mean, I think we can, as long as we don't create these perverse incentives by um, allowing them to sort of be this, this safe haven or provide this liability shield um, in which there will, will be perverse incentives. If we, if we ask regulators uh, to enforce due diligence regulation strictly on the outcomes of due diligence and to really look at is a company's due diligence effective, Companies themselves will choose auditors or, reg or, or initiatives that help them achieve that aim. And then that will, you know, that will keep, that will be the business model then. The, the, the auditing schemes that are effective for companies will be used. But if we create this sort of artificial layer of let's push everything through an auditor or let's trust the auditors 100%, I definitely don't think we should, uh, we can trust them to that, to that degree. Thank you. And Aruna, you also have something to share. Yeah, no, I, I just want to point out that going forward, once we have, you know, there is a growth of regulation. So we, we're seeing growth of, uh, you know, import-based restrictions, be it based on deforestation or forced labor that's going to come through uh, uh, the, the due diligence related directive. I think, which will bring more scrutiny. So whatever the company is choosing to do will be, they should be prepared for greater scrutiny, uh, including off the report itself. And that itself is should put everybody on alert that if they're going to engage in, in so some sort of like one or two days, sort of quick and easy, just going to a factory, interview whoever's available, even if they're uh, arbitrarily chosen, but it's not a safe environment, that that's going to show, the quality of it is going to show in the paperwork. and and. Because the, the key thing that was happening before is what Joseph alluded to. It's, it, it was all happening in a non-transparent environment where there was no regulatory scrutiny. You cannot possibly go down that route when that fundamentally changes. And I think they have to be prepared no matter what they, you know, because I have also seen reports that are long investigations, very thoroughly done, but those are done only when they think there's going to be an import restriction uh, by the US CBP, or for example, it's it's front page news scandal, that it's, you know, that then they sort of invest and launch into a full scale investigation with off, um, you know, off site interviews, etc. But, but the but the key challenge is even the most robust investigation conducted by a third party is not going to drive remedy. That's the key. It's, it's, it's going to be a report that is written up and given to the companies themselves. And so what the companies choose to do with the findings and the corrective actions proposed is the real challenge. 
And so, for example, I often hear a lot of companies say zero tolerance, and that just means they're just going to up and leave. The moment they hear of a forced labor, they want to cut and run and protect their own reputation. They're not concerned about, okay, what is actually going to happen to the workers who are making these complaints? Are we really delivering remedy? And what does it look like? I think if the, the legislature is going to shift, and I hope, and I think it will, shift the focus to remedy a lot more and that and you know the current systems will have to change to adapt to that thank you aruna we have we are able to uh, take a comment or question from uh, Car caroline caroline from oxfam please go ahead and then we will continue with the panel thank you very much and thank you everyone for this great panel and great discussions those are topics highly important super hard to uh, to find solutions but i think we're we're moving in the right direction. I think we've, I love the first question as well in terms of the credibility of those processes of those companies who are engaging, should we trust them, et cetera. And I think a part of the, uh, the response to this question is we need to have clear standards of what do we expect, expect us term, in terms of human rights due diligence, right? We need to know exactly what it means. And when we talk about rights holder engagement, when we talk about meaningful engagement as we're supposed to be seeing in those processes, I think we need to be clear on what it means, right? At Oxfam, we've been promoting human rights impact assessment and community-based human rights impact assessment for a long time now. And we've came, we, we came out with some criteria for what it means. And I think we would all agree that those processes will be meaningful if the engagement starts super early, right? If it starts from the beginning of the, the company operation, the beginning of thinking of a company and is ongoing, right? So that the, the findings can be integrated, the findings, the, 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 the plans can be adapted, the plans can be modified, et cetera. It needs to be inclusive, it needs to, to include the most affected people. So not only the workers, the workers are key, they're essential, but beyond workers as well, other affected people and making sure that they engage with people who are, holding divergent views as well, not only the people who are in favor. And the last piece that I'd like to say, which connects to what was just said uh, by Aruna, I think is it's not the end of the process. Conducting a robust uh, assessment, a robust uh, a human rights impact assessment, or as, as robust would be this process, it's not the end. This is a starting point to implementing, finding solution, and the engagement must continue up to there. It must continue up to the point where identifying the creative solution, finding what will work for the affected rights holders. So I think if we have a clear understanding of what is needed, then it would help uh, trusting those who are implementing those. Thank things. you. Thank you so Thank much, everyone. Thank you very much for your input. And we are right on time. And it's perfect timing also because um, MEP Lara Volters was able to join us. Um, and so we will hear from her soon too. Uh, welcome to you, Lara Volters. Thank you so much for making time for this in your busy day in Strasbourg. We really appreciate it. And it's really perfect timing because we are just now turning to the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive uh, on which you are taking the lead uh, in the Legal Affairs Committee. And to give you a little breathing space and a little uh, time to hear from our speakers, I will other speakers, I will first ask uh, them a question on this. Uh, I know that all the organizations present have been engaging on Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive that's in the works in the European Union. So it's not a question on whether you find this relevant, but I want to ask you, why do you find this, uh, this directive relevant with regard to social auditing? And also, what have you been advocating in the ongoing political process? And you each have two minutes uh, to explain this. And let's start with Aruna. Okay, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, I think being concise is the tricky part. I will try. Um, I think, I'm going to focus my uh, what I say on social audits and certifications, right? Uh, I think key in this legislation, one of the key things we're trying to drive home and make a lot of um, stakeholders who are developing the legislation aware is of the gaps and the problems of social audits uh, and certifications because they're not really aware. In fact, ironically, it's the it's also the multi-stakeholder social auditing schemes and the certification schemes that are equally saying, look, we're not the only people and we, we can't guarantee robust uh, human rights due diligence. So the, the key sort of saying, don't equate the two. There could be a role depending on, you know, what exactly is going on in the name of social audits and certifications. Um, but you can't equate the two. That's the first sort of that's been a key political message we've, we've tried to bring about to educate more people, etc. The second is you can't have anything called uh, is, is sort of no shields, no safety nets for companies, because if, if the idea is 
you know, you cannot have a social auditor certification that it, it, they, by their very nature, because they go in, an auditor goes in on a certification scheme, the pre-certification, they go in, look at the environment and come out, right? They, they're not there ongoing. They cannot guarantee an ongoing risk assessment. They don't substitute for grievance redress. So in such a situation where a company finds a grievance and is implicated, what the company does to remediate should be the central question. Just because a company can show that they've conducted a social auditing uh, or part of it, or they're part of a certification scheme, they can't be exempt from liability. They can't be a shield. There has to be a full analysis of what the company brought to the table in terms of its due diligence measures and, and on the remedy front. And I think that's those have been our two key inputs. I'm so sorry, but I had an issue with my earphones for your first point. I only caught the end. Would you mind just um, repeating just briefly the first point? Yes, I, I was asking uh, first the other speakers uh, why they find the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence Directive relevant with regard to social auditing and what they have been advocating, their organizations have been advocating in the ongoing political process. This is what they are now responding to. And warm welcome to you. Uh, let's hear from Joseph. Yeah, and thanks so much, Laura, for joining us um, today. Uh, you're obviously playing a crucial role in, the, in leading the, the efforts for an ambitious uh, due diligence uh, directive in Europe. So we're really happy for you to, uh, to hear from you today. Um, I mean, I would say, look, I would echo a lot of the things that Aruna said. Our main point, first of all, would be there, there, there is not really a role for auditing in any enforcement of due diligence. So I would say, first of all, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, due auditing and certifications can be a part of a company's individual due diligence. So it can be the, the directive can uh, mention, as the OECD guidelines do mention, companies can use auditing, can use certifications, can use industry schemes in their due diligence. That's fine in terms of the content, the way that the content of due diligence is set up. But in any sort of uh, equivalents or proxy or um, even indicators of human rights due diligence, the legislation, the directive should stay away from, from auditing and certifications. That's, it's a company's, it's up to a company's own um, uh, uh, decision about whether or not we shouldn't make sort of some sort of artificial uh, decision already that an auditing uh, will be good for a company or should be used by a company. It's up to the, an individual company. And so what we've been audited, uh, uh, arguing for at, uh, based on our evidence and based on the research that we've done is that the directive um, should not uh, look to uh, auditing or certification in any way in the enforcement part of the of the directive. There should be no kind of shield. It should not even be an indicator because there are just so many examples of where it has failed. And again, companies may use them if they want to, if they are effective in getting the results that companies will be expected to have. And if the regulators and judges look at the effectiveness of due diligence and what kind of results it's delivering for workers and for people on the ground, certain auditing schemes may be, you know, may come up. But the, in terms of the, the actual legislating of due diligence, um, they sh this should really stick to the way the OECD guidelines frame it. A piece of due diligence, but not a proxy, not a shield, not in any way an indicator of, of due diligence. That's where I'd leave it. Thank you, Joseph. And Elspeth, let's hear from you. Where's the industrial Europe on this? Thank you. And uh, thanks for joining us, Lara. It's nice to see you. And thank you for your engagement, because I've got to say, um, Lara, you've truly been you know, open when it comes to speaking to workers and trade unions. And that's really important for this for this legislation. And um, so, as I said before, we really see the EU's proposal as a real opportunity to make a change in due diligence. And for us, we've always said it should the scope should be large. It should be for all companies, for all sectors. We know that the TCLF sectors, textiles and garments, it's 99% SMEs, so we need to ensure that the scope is, scope is there. We've got a real chance to make a difference and we're, we're keen to get it right. And I know, Lara, when we were together in the Parliament last week, you said yourself that workers need to be right at the centre um, of this, of this um, legislation, and that's absolutely vital for us as trade unions. Um, you'll have already seen the joint letter that we signed with them um, with Clean Clothes Campaign and E2C on this. There's clear evidence that social audits as they exist today don't work. 
there's no transparency, they're not monitored properly, we don't have access to them, so we can't see as trade union trade unions what's what's been found, what the issues are, and if there's any follow-up. Um, I know that, as I said before, we've got Andy Hall here, a human rights campaigner who's got experience, for example, in Top Glove, one of the companies was, we've looked at before, when you can make changes on the ground, but we need to have access to, to the information before we can do anything as trade unions. So we need real checks, we need proper remedies. And in terms of what we're doing, which was the question, we've got our own position as um, Industrial Europe. We're working with the wider civil society group and um, we're banging on everyone's doors. Um, various MEPs, Lara might be sick of seeing me pop up at um, every event, but we're there. We're raising concrete examples. Um, the discussions are still going on in the Parliament and we want to make this work. We can share with you um, and your colleagues, Lara, why social audits don't work, some concrete examples. Um, I'm really, we're really keen to make sure we can get some good final wording um, to make sure that it works. We just want it to work. We want it to be simple. We want it to work on the ground. Um, and we've still got some time, hopefully, to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now, hopefully, we have given uh, Mamie P. Lara Holters enough time to settle down into our webinar. Warm welcome again. Um, um, Ms. Volters, you have been working on this due diligence file uh, longer than almost anyone else. Namely, you led the work in the Legal Affairs Committee that adopted own initiative report, setting the standard for the European Commission to follow. However, despite that report having been uh, quite overwhelmingly supported in the plenary, we have now been seeing many members of the parliament walking back on their commitments at the time of the report. Um, so when it comes to social auditing and certification, which in that terminology of the directive would fall under the independent third party verification, uh, what has the political discussion been like as of late? I know you are very intensively negotiating, compromising and so on. So where do we stand in political discussion? Thank you. Um, thanks for having me also. And uh, and hi from uh, my hotel room in, in Strasbourg. Sorry that I couldn't join earlier or can't stay so late, but um, we, we have the plenary session kicking off today. But um, very heartened by, by what I've heard so far. Um, I think maybe maybe the first point, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. But um, the first point is a very common sensical point, but it 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 needs to be made, and it's the point um, that I think Elspeth made on, on there needs to be impact um, from this directive, right? And I think there's a real danger that in the negotiations that will follow in the Parliament that um, you know members will get so consumed by the detail of this that will will forget to do a sort of sense check every time of is this actually going to make a difference? And we have to do that because otherwise we risk locking in something that you know makes everyone feel warm and and, and fuzzy at best um, but doesn't do anything and we we have to absolutely avoid that and i think that for me what that means is that um, you can hope for the best but you have to legislate for the worst um, and the worst for me is um a couple of eye-opening uh, anecdotes I heard from a professor specialized in the auditing industry um, from Cornell University, from, from the Labor Institute. And he said, make no mistake, in China, um, possibly in other, uh, other parts of, of Asia, and you'll know this better than me, but there is such a thing as a sh sort of shadow auditing industry. Um, and um, I... I was hoping um, that this was a joke, but but he was telling anecdotes of companies um, being able to to um, you know to give a large um, a, a large uh, company that that asks for an audit, so so say a large clothing brand, a whole package of listen, we'll go to the factory that you need audited, um, we'll have a look at working conditions, but if those working conditions um, wouldn't pass our, our, our tests, then what we can also do, what we can also offer you is just an entirely new factory that, you know, just for the day, we'll put a new sign on, you know, we'll place some workers there that know how to give good answers. And, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that, that, that um, we, can, we can write you a positive audit. I mean, you hope that these are the, the exceptions and maybe these are, are really the, the very, very cynical examples of, you know, um, the, the, this type of, of, of practice gone wrong. Um, but when I say you have to legislate for the worst, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we, we're we doing this because we know that voluntary approaches or, you know, um, uh, types of, of self-certification or outsourcing, um, you know, your due diligence to others that it hasn't worked. Um, and for me, what that means for the, the, the audit industry um, or, or social auditing, um, unfortunately, um, I think that um, 
there's 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 definitely a a place for this. I think there's definitely value in proper social auditing, but it needs to be bona fide. It needs to be serious. There needs to be meaningful engagement um, with those on the ground and those involved. And um, that is 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 not a given. Um, and um, there's there's the danger of um, you know politically. Um, of trying to make social auditing into something that it shouldn't be, which is exactly as some of the speakers said here, um, you know, a tool for then providing a, a safe harbor for, for companies. Um, and I think that would be a little bit like, you know, handing the keys of your car to, you know, a driver and then then sitting next to him and closing your eyes and saying, you know, I, I, I trust you, you'll get us to our destination. No, you need to keep watching the road yourself at, at every step of the, of the way. And I think um, that's, the approach that we need to, to integrate in, in this piece of legislation. Yes, um, there's a consensus that, you know, third party verification, social auditing has a role, um, but um, the importance placed on that role, I think that's the, the, the political question. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that, that that auditing doesn't become the safe harbor, doesn't become a reason for ticking boxes. Um, and that it also, um, whatever happens, that doesn't become a way of, of again, discharging accountability. Um, and I think social auditing for, for some political groups is starting to become a sort of end in itself for those, you know, those above mentioned reasons. Um, and that's the, the political fight that, uh, that we're, we're leading at the moment. Um, I think that's, that's contrary to the spirit of the OECD guidelines. Um, I also think there's a wider story to be told here if we're talking about the garment industry in particular, um, and that needs to be told through making sure that we integrate concepts of a living wage into this, um, that we talk about the liability of auditors also. Um, that's that's something that I'm very keen on saying, well, if there's a faulty audit that leads to damage or harm, um, then there should be joint responsibility and, and liability. Um, I'm not saying that that's a fight that's been won yet, absolutely not, but I mean, there, there need to be consequences. Um, I also think that all of this goes hand in hand with, with access to justice and grievance mechanism. Um, although there too, there's a, a danger, I think, um, of reducing liability to companies that haven't provided redress. And while I think that redress is very, very important, um, what I would fear is that, um, you know, we say, well, as long as a company has tried to redress an issue, um, you know, there, there shouldn't be liability because then who, who determines whether that redress was, was adequate, whether it was sufficient, et cetera. Um, but that's all the sort of wider story, I think, when we talk about the garment industry um, that, that, you know, we need to talk about in the, uh, in the parliament. Um, I think I can leave it there. And maybe there's a question coming through. I'm not sure. Thank you so much. Yes, you hinted. Sorry, at a lot last of... point. Last Please thing I want ahead. to say. You very, very kindly said that I've been working on this longer than than anyone, perhaps in the in the parliament. Um, you know, with with the label uh, corporate due diligence. But um, the reason, of course, that we're able to do this work in the parliament and that I'm able to do this work is because all those people in this call and, and others have worked so hard over the years, you know, to make that possible and for that sort of fertile ground to be there. So I, I just wanted to mention, it's very kind of you, but this, this is something that um, others have worked on much longer than me. That's also very kind of you to acknowledge. And that's why I also said that you worked on this almost longer than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, all of our organizations have been very active on this file uh, and even preceding it becoming a political conversation uh, at the EU level. Um, well, now we will, uh, you hinted uh, in your previous interventions already a bit at what your red lines might be, so to speak. What's the real no-no as the legislators, you know, are discussing these uh, really fine details of the legislation. So now let's hear from, um, from uh, Aruna, Joseph and Elspeth very briefly. What are your red lines regarding social auditing and certification in the context of due diligence? And then we will give it back to, uh, to Lara Volters to react to that. So Aruna. Yeah. No, I, I guess uh, really owe a debt of gratitude to like uh, Lara Walters uh, and many like her who are very strongly aligned and making sure that, you know, the direction we want will be taken in the legislation. I think she's laid it out really well. I think that there are limited to social audits and certifications. There are, there are a whole host of red lines, but I'll, I'll only be on these two topics. One is they can't, you can't collapse human rights due diligence, uh, human rights and environmental due diligence with social audits and certifications. When I say collapse, it means uh, 
if a company comes saying, look, we've shown this and this is our certification um, or this is the social audit report, merely because you've done it doesn't automatically make your human rights or environmental due diligence robust. There is a range of measures. The company will be assessed on a range of measures, including value chain transparency, how they're looking at their purchasing, you know, a range of things, uh, stakeholder consultations. So I think they should be prepared to demonstrate how they're doing on all of those fronts, right? So there's no collapsing of the two. The second is merely because you've done a social audits and certifications that, that cannot exempt a company from liability, by which I mean, look, I mean, workers can be harmed, they can experience forced labor, there may be intergenerational toxic pollution, there may be a range of problems that actually needs cleaning up. And it actually costs, it's, it's, it's cost people their lives, or it's cost irreparable damage. And a certification or a social audit cannot repair any of that. And a company cannot be exempt from liability because of it. So I think that clarity has to be, We it, it, a lot of the times there's a lot of confusion about, okay, th this constitutes due diligence, we've done our bit, and so we, we're not re ready for a cleanup. And that's not true. Companies, the, a part of remedy is what are you doing to make sure that the person who has suffered is as close to whole or as next to what their precondition was before they were harmed. And I think that key concept of remedy, what will companies do to remediate has to be so central to it. And only a company that has demonstrated that it, it has taken all reasonable measures to remediate should, you know, that should be factored into uh, what, what comes out of the liability question. And I think that, so a social audit or a certification alone cannot result in safe harbors. Any exemption from liability is central. It's, it's uh, critical to, this, to, the, to the legislation. Thank you, Aruna. And now so that we have enough time uh, for open discussion, let's hear it very briefly also from uh, Joseph first and then Elspeth. Yeah, just very briefly, because I think Laura and Aruna have, have laid it out. I would totally agree with the red lines for me, I guess, are again, anything that sort of approximates um, auditing or certification with due diligence. It, that If anything that suggests that there could be some sort of a proxy and that could take different forms. I mean, that we've talked about know, no safe harbors, no uh, liability shields. I think even anything that suggests that companies that do an audit or are part of a certification scheme should have a lighter monitoring or enforcement regime. For me, that would also be a red line because that's sort of indicating some sort of a, a proxy. Anything that suggests that companies are not responsible, responsible for their own due diligence, not responsible for looking at the road themselves um, because they've done some sort of audit or certification would be a red line. Um, even anything that includes auditing or certification as an indicator in due diligence, I think is also a slippery slope down that, you know, that lighter monitoring um, uh, scheme. So um, I would put all of these in, in terms of, of red lines. I think it's okay if the, if, the, if the legislation mentions them as a possibility in due diligence, just like the OECD guidelines do, mentions them, companies can use them. Sometimes they can be effective in terms of generating or increasing leverage but anything that puts them in that range of being a proxy or an indicator for due diligence for me would be a red line. Thank you, Elspeth. Perfect. So red lines for us, I think um, companies are responsible. We've got, to, we've got to start there. So companies are responsible, all companies, including SMEs. Um, and social audits can't be used as a get out of jail free card, shall we say. Transparency and monitoring is absolutely vital, and we know that's not the case for social audits as they currently stand. Um, Lara, as you said last week, when we get to a complaint, it's already almost too late. The whole point of this legislation is to stop the need for complaints, so we need to move away from this trade unions get involved when it's complaints. No, we need to be involved um, from the start. We need much more transparency. We want to know what the findings are, plans of actions. And when it comes to issues, there needs to be sanctions and we need it, there to be proper actions such as, you know, exclusion from public procurement. We really need this legislation to have teeth, otherwise it's not going to work. That's the, that's the big demand for us. It needs, the red line is, it needs to work. It needs to work. That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, but again, it's not a silver bullet. We need to make sure that there's, you know, aisle conventions such as on um, Freedom Association are actually um, held in practice. Thanks. Thank you. So, Ms. Walters, uh, hearing these views, uh, what do you think about it? And also, do you have red lines of your own? You said you want to legislate for the worst. So what would cross the line in the wrong way in trying to do that? Um, well, I have to say that I, I, I can find myself in, in what the previous speakers have said very much. Um, 
and I think we're we're all saying you know versions of the same thing, which is that yes, you know, social auditing or certification mechanisms uh, can be a useful tool if used well, if meaningful. Or, or used meaningfully if you know if we're talking about quality quality auditing um, but no absolutely they shouldn't uh, collapse um, you know the due diligence duty they shouldn't be a sort of silver bullet or a get out of jail free card um, and um, you know due to those pressures of uh, political pressures of um, you know due diligence being perceived as as another administrative burden um, you know by, by 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 those you know on the liberal or or the conservative side of the house um, this will be um, that you know it'll be really important to, to to push back there and for me it would be a a um, you know red line um, to go and use these mechanisms um, and and mold them into to safe harbors or or mold them into a um, you know a a version of due diligence that then substitutes due diligence. Um, I don't think that should happen. Um, but um, the the political pressures are enormous because, as you said, while there was um, while there was a lot of support for the 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 uh, the INL the 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 initiative um, on this uh, previously. Um, it's it's a different world since then. Um, so many of those in, in Parliament, um, you know, uh, who who supported then have have woken up to this now and realized that this is actually, you know, potentially a a game changer. And of course, politically, um, you know, in Parliament, you'll very often hear due diligence in the same sentence as you know, COVID, war in Ukraine, inflation, i.e., you know, the the general global outlook and context for 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 companies. Um, is a difficult one, therefore, this is not the time or the moment. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that just to sketch a little bit the political pressures, um, you know, involved in this negotiation. But uh, I think I've, I've been clear on, on, on my intention here. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my very best to make sure that this doesn't become a, um, a wax nose, as we say in Dutch, but I don't know what the equivalent would be in other languages. Um, don't even know if that's clear. Um, how would I put that? Basically, that that uh, that social auditing doesn't doesn't become a a substitute for due diligence. Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. Or ticking boxes, <laughs> as we said in our <laughs> seminar title, webinar title. Um, now we will open the discussion. I want to just clarify something. I made a mistake and sent my personalized link to the speakers. So now I think we have a bit of a mess in the chat. I think many people might be appearing under the name Lara Holters. Um, so I, I, if you are, if you receive the link from me and you're typing in the chat, please also write who's actually writing because there might be a bit of a confusion. Um, so yes, now we will open for the discussion. We have, we have about 20 minutes. We're hoping for a bit more, but so it is. Uh, please make your questions or interventions really concise. Uh, stick with about one minute and so that we try to get responses. Let's see who would like to go first. Do you have any questions or interventions? Yes. Nilsson, I am apologizing in advance if I'm going to be butchering your names. So we have Nilsson from IDI. Please go ahead. Please do stay concise. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much to the panelists. And I, I have a question uh, as a follow up to what Elizabeth said about, you know, stakeholder participation to the audit. So I was just wondering if they have, and, and I absolutely agree with that, stakeholders need to be part of the audits from the beginning because that's that's a way to get like um accurate information but uh, i'm just wondering if there are good examples and maybe this could be from the you know certification or auditing schemes that uh, cso's are part of um um so if if they have seen any good examples of stakeholder participation in the audit process and the certification process or is this still um, something that we all aspire to achieve, um, or are we are we there yet? At least in some of the initiatives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's take another question. Uh, this is from uh, Miss Olia, and I would invite you to turn on the camera when you're asking the question, if you can. You don't have to, but it's an invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, I'm just going to raise the issue uh, listening to awesome. what we're talking about is that uh, when we talk about uh, human rights and environmental due diligence, we have the presumption that actually companies know what it is. Uh, where, where, whereas often uh, in my work, I realize that the social audit 
just gives them the answer because it's quick and it's a certificate based. They can just get a tick box. And one issue that I want to bring um, is that it is about capacity. And we as a starting new, uh, a new NGO, which is working in the area of business and human rights in Bulgaria, we can't give a certificate. We can give expertise in helping companies to, to go through this process of due diligence, but we're not in a position to give certificate and we actually in, in a disadvantage. So I just want to say that uh, we, it is important to have all the training that both companies, NGOs and everyone involved in this whole process knows what to do because in the end of the day, companies will go to, 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 for, to social audits and Unfortunately, we know that this is not the right way. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. And we also have, apologies again if I say it wrong, uh, Bishnupriya Dutta, would you like to also yes. ask your question? Yes, I, I'm sorry, there would be a lot of surround sound. I'm just coming back from the airport. I have a very precise question regarding remediation, right? The, I mean, I'm from India. There are a lot of human rights violation years and I get a lot of calls and is there a guideline that I can go through which is subjective to the kind of violations that I come across? You're asking about specifically about remediation, yeah? Yes, please. I'm asking specifically regarding remediation. Thank you. All right, we will now hand it to our speakers to respond. So we had uh, three interventions whether there are any good examples of stakeholder engagement in such processes that we're discussing. Um, then we had an intervention about uh, that there's a presumption that the companies know what actually the due diligence means, and it's a question of capacity and how uh, certain organizations cannot issue certificates, but companies might like them. And then lastly, we had a question on remediation. This one we could also answer in the chat if we don't get to everything. Uh, so who would like to respond? To this. I am not seeing my speakers at the moment. I invite you to go ahead. Aha, uh -huh. uh, Elspeth, please you go first. And then Aruna. Thanks. Could I, I'll be, I'm I'll so be. sorry. Could I just say one thing because I need to run off actually. So I just wanted to. Oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. Yes, apologies. Yes. Um, please go I, ahead. I just wanted to thank you and uh, uh, and and make my way to uh, to Parliament. Um, and I think that the questions are in good hands with the, with the other panelists. Although perhaps to the question from um, the Bulgarian participant, I would just add that I think it's also important that due diligence becomes um, a matter of the the boardroom. Um, so it's a capacity question. It's also a question of of who ultimately needs to take responsibility. Um, but uh, I'll I'll leave that there. Thank you so much for having me, and so sorry for the for the very short uh, uh, hello and 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 bye. Thank you for being <laughs> here and keep up the fight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So Elspeth, please go. Very, very quickly so we can get a second round in. In terms of good examples, I have not personally been involved in any, but I know that there has been some um, some um, organisations trying to reach out more to civil society. So if anyone wants to share, Aruna, you might be better placed for that question. Um, Ola, in terms of um, education resources, we agree. We agree. We've already had discussions with our European social partners. Um, and I know that one of them is online already from Footwear. We've already had discussions about preparing because we know that we have some SMEs when you have family run companies and already they need information. So we've raised this, we've already work, started working with the ILO to try and do some preparation work. And we've specifically said to the commission, the European Commission, what are you doing in terms of um, outreach with the full supply chain? Because we know that we need everyone needs to get ready now. There could be issues in terms of, of languages as well. So that's something we definitely, definitely agree on. And in terms of information on remediation, I know that Impact did some work with regards to forced labour. So I know that there is some information out there, but for us, remediation, we'd always want sign off from the workers that the workers are happy with the, with the agreement. We think that's really, really important. It's not only for the company to decide, this is what you get, go away. It's for the workers to, to make sure that they're happy. And again, we're not only talking about wages, and um, sometimes we have to look at um, access to justice. We need to look at uh, wider issues. So we need to make sure that workers are involved, workers' representatives before it's signed off. Thanks. Aruna? Yeah, I mean, uh, on the capacity question, I think um, Ashley Lara made a really, really important point, which we hope that one thing the regulation will do 
is to drive up the political attention these get these topics get in companies because one of the challenges is not just about resources that NGOs or civil society can bring to the table, but it's also really companies where at least that one person or half a person is working on what they call CSR, and, and they don't really have the power to drive the actual policies of the company. So I think the embedding at the top level, including what Lara mentioned, the board is really, really important because that sort of sets the stage for how much resources the company dedicates internally, but also how much all teams like purchasing team, the CSR team, the design team, and all teams really understand what they have to do to move uh, consistently with human rights. On, on, the, on, the, um, on the remediation question, that's a really good and tough one. I think I would think of remediation as a process as well. How do you arrive at what is the right um, correction act, corrective action that needs to be taken? There is some guidance, uh, as Alps, uh, Alps mentioned about um, uh, forced labor. There are some guide that there are guidelines on specific things, but I think the challenge is whether in a particular context, in a particular geography, like what are the facts and circumstances, and how do you arrive at it, and with inputs from the affected communities or their representatives, including whether they're worker rights representatives directly, either unions or if there are no unions in the place, worker rights organizations, and what would be the best way to implement it and monitoring the outcome. So, sort of, if you arrive at a corrective action, how long should it take? For the corrective action to be implemented if there are delays what's the backup i think all of those things have to be worked out and one model i would say to look at what remediation should look like and be and implemented is is really the accord because it sort of gives you sort of here's the here's what remediation looks like here's how it should be tracked here's here's how it should be transparently reported and if remediation is not reached within a particular timeline what are the consequences for all parties involved i think that's also should be worked out in the remediation plan Thank you so much, Aruna, for bringing this up. I was hoping someone will. It's uh, about the International Accord on Fire and Building Safety, indeed. And I wanted to also point to it as a good example of stakeholder engagement, because not uh, because there's uh, representation also in the governing uh, structures and so on of those uh, most affected. Uh, but Joseph wanted to also to respond, I think. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Just very briefly, because I was going to mention this as well on the remediation. And I think Elfbeth said it also well, the, the, the worker-led or a community-led, community-driven part of this is really essential and the accords and also uh, you know the fair food program and the use in the US with the Immokalee uh, workers I think are good examples of um, processes initiatives in which are that are led by workers led by you know the uh, the rights holders that provide a system for remediation um, and I'd also just point to maybe the I mean, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights has also done some work on, on remediation, and obviously there are there are many aspects to it, um, but the, the centrality of the workers or the rights of the victims or the rights holders um, is, is crucial in all of this. Um, and also just want to respond very briefly, there was a, a question in the chat um, from Lelena, I think was a good one also about, how, about, about the enforcement and in which ways um, the enforcement can take place. And I think, look, obviously, um, you, we ha you have limited resources for regulators and there is corruption, um, but simply um, outsourcing or allowing auditing or certification to take a role in that is really just a, a slippery slope. Um, and I think more looking at um, having, you know, maybe a limited number of, of targeted random um, checks and, and enforcement actions by regulators at the state level is really a way to have a, have a greater impact and it, you spend your, your limited amount of resources on um, having robust checks into individual companies at individual times. That is what will sort of keep companies on their toes. That will what, what make the uh, due diligence really more angling toward uh, effectiveness on the ground um, than sort of building in some sort of in-between step with uh, auditing. Thank you so much. Let's try to have a second round of questions. Uh, we already have David, apologies to, to Hollander. I hope I say this right. Uh, you go ahead and we can take uh, one more after that. Yeah, that, that, that sounds about right. Um, so hi everybody, I work for ICL. We work together with uh, a lot of different multi-stakeholder initiatives, sustainability standards, uh, who often have uh, some type of certification and audit tool all built in them. Um, my question, well, first of all, just to stress that we we do broadly uh, agree with with the point that these type of third party systems can't replace company obligations and responsibilities. That's that's very clear. Um, but we do believe that um, 
the idea that each company uh, will somehow be able to solve this very complex process of due diligence itself in its own little legal silo and be effective and impactful in doing so. We, we believe that's a bit of a, um, you know, a, a challenging assumption. Uh, and so we, we do think that uh, MSIs and especially those that use credible practices that um, have, uh, um, you know, a level of transparency, a, lot of, a level of multi-stakeholder buy-in are, are really going to be critical to steer due diligence processes in the, in, in, in the right way. Um, and the question I have to the panel is, um, you know, we, we heard a bit about the importance of mitigation. Um, do you think it's possible to, you know, at sector level or at a broader level to get some consistency about what good mitigation practices look like? Or is that always completely dependable and completely has to be, you know, let's say improvised based on the, the you know, the supplier? Um, and the same goes for outcomes, you know. Uh, I think Joseph mentioned that uh, we need to look at outcomes. That's the only thing that matter. Um, how do you understand outcomes? How you, would you define that? Because in my understanding, if the outcome is a human rights violation, that already is quite, you know, far kind of an escalated issue, right? Thank you, David. So is there, yeah. So, Sorry, I'll have to questions. just to give no, no, no. yeah just to give opportunity to another person. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Ridby from Rainforest Alliance also has her hand up. Please be very concise. We're going to start running out of time. Okay. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Um, and I want to just first tell the group that um, you know I'm in, in alignment with a lot of your points that have been raised from the NGO community. Um, you know we are a certification, but we do have our own perspective on this. Um, so I would first say that you know our position is that certification is not consistent, is not sufficient um, to meet the requirements of the newly emerging laws. So we are in alignment with you on that. Um, I would also say that we're well familiar with the work worker-driven social responsibility models that are out there, and we're taking a close look at what elements of those we can integrate into our program. So I have the greatest respect for those. Um, coming from here in the US, I've known about the Fair Food Program for a long time. I've seen that it isn't necessarily, hasn't been successfully replicated outside the US yet, but that's not to say that we shouldn't keep trying. Um, some of the changes that we're trying to make to our social auditing and certification scheme are um, requiring stakeholder engagement within certain audits. Um, we're, building, we're building our capacity to engage with unions and include them in audits where possible. Um, and that is, should be possible in most cases where there is a union. Unfortunately, in agriculture, only a small proportion of workplaces are unionized, but um, we, are, we have hired a person specifically to work on trade union engagement to improve performance in that area. Um, and of course, if issues, if issues are not remediated, uh, a farm cannot be certified under our program. Um, but I would encourage the community to kind of look at social auditing and certification, not as the same thing, but as two different things to be examined and analyzed separately. Um, of course, we use social auditing within our certification program, but um, we go beyond that in terms of really looking more closely at what remediation can take place and how we can engage the whole supply chain and making sure that a remediation takes place at farm level. So I think my question to the group would be picking up on David's point, um, you know, social auditing and certification, what we have going for us, and I know there are many downsides, but what we have going for us is scale, right? Um, and it is, it is a big question mark whether any individual company can do their own due diligence, even at farm level, for example, maybe six, seven tiers down, um, what does that look like exactly? You know, who are the people that are going in there and doing the monitoring, um, especially if there isn't a union? Rachel, I'm sorry, but way... we'll have to yeah. wrap up. Yeah, okay, so that's my question. Um, you know, is there some way to achieve scale through collective action? Um, maybe not through certification, but, um, you know, is there some way to improve the current regimes rather than just trashing them and starting over? Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'll take one more, and I'm afraid we can't take any more than that. We have Nadia from Norwegian Consumer Authority with her hand up for a while. Please be short, and then we'll hear from yeah. the speaker. Yes, thank you for the very interesting uh, panel. Uh, we are the Norwegian Consumer Authority that supervises the Norwegian Transparency Act. That is a legally binding act, which builds on the OECD guidelines. And we see more and more companies asking us about using uh, third parties 
Uh, and um, Joseph mentioned like uh, robust checks by state could be an option. Uh, but our team supervising the act at the moment, we are between eight and 10 people. So there are limited resources uh, uh, for some states. Uh, so my question is, um, not only is this a question of capacity, but also competence. And uh, I assume some third party companies when it comes to, for instance, digitalization have uh, a lot of competence that companies at the moment, especially now in the beginning, doesn't have. Is there a middle way or is like, is third party, um, using third parties a no-go? Uh, what are your viewpoints? Is there any middle ground or can like companies also have a closer dialogue with the third parties and follow up? Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's go for a final, very fast round by our speakers. Uh, I am not seeing you, so maybe raise your hand, whoever wants to go first or start speaking. Aruna, Elizabeth, uh, Elspeth, or Joseph. Would you like to take uh, some of these questions? Sure. Um, I can take a stab, and they're all, these are all, you know, hour long, we can have discussions. I mean, the first on the, I will go last first, because I remember that question on the, on the issue of capacity and competence. I mean, I think uh, the key thing, I mean, so it's, it's not about, you can never use social audits and certifications, right? The question is, how much effort are you going to put into it? And then how much are you monitoring the output? what the actual findings is. So if I were a company, I would pay a lot more scrutiny to who I'm appointing, who's paying for the audits, uh, who's tasked in the team with looking at what the findings say, what is the audit methodology, uh, who am I using, especially are they providing other services to my company or the supplier? So there's you know high risk of conflicts of interest, which would then conflict out. Ideally, you would go with like, you know, a complete sort of worker rights organization or a community based organization, if, if, uh, if that's possible to do, because I mean, depending on the context and the environment. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a, as independent from the company's operations, the company's product testing, uh, suppliers, you know, so there's no, there's nobody can say, look, I mean, this company is also providing X, Y, Z other services. So how independent are they from your services? So I think that's central, right? And then finally, once a report is done, what are they doing? So as, as a consumer affairs authority, you could ask a series of questions that companies have to declare uh, to the consumer authority, and you can do a spot check on uh, some things. The other most powerful thing the consumer authority could require is, is say that we want all these reports to be transparent, uh, including, for example, to the, to the point made um, by a colleague from Rainforest Alliance, make the reports transparent. Uh, if, if the Norwegian Consumer Affairs Authority could require the audit reports to be transparent, the corrective actions to be transparent, everything to be in the public domain, I think it would really sort of cut down the consultancy, the corruption, the, you know, the, the deception, et cetera. That, that piece of it would automatically have to self-correct because everything is going to be in the public domain. It thrives because there's so much non-transparency around it. And I'm, you know, and I'm not saying specifically about Rainforest Alliance, I'm saying it's a general industry-wide problem, right? Uh, it, it incentivizes integrity, transparency automatically is a, is a very strong check. Um, so that, that's two concrete measures the Consumer Affairs Authority could take. Thank you, Aruna. Joseph has his hand up, and let's not forget about the questions about mitigation and outcomes, and how do you do this at scale? I think you're mostly in agreement among one another uh, on individual points, but let's touch upon those two. Joseph, please, you go next. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. Really good questions, um, all of them. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I had been wanting to say, too, is one one piece that is going to be there. I mean, obviously, companies are going to keep using auditing. Companies are going to use um, certifications. Companies are going to use multi-stakeholder initiatives. And as I said before, I think all of those really do have a place, right? They are a piece. They can be a piece of due diligence, especially when it comes to uh, bringing in expertise uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises, especially when it comes to increasing leverage, which is a crucial part of, uh, of due diligence, of course. Um, but there is a place for that in due diligence. And it is, and it is not with the regulator to, to look just solely at that. There is, um, there, there is a place for companies to use it, you know, tailored to their own situation, tailored to their own needs, so trying to create this sort of mechanism whereby there's, you know, sort of it's this ticking boxes or one size fits all kind of me mechanism that all companies should go through is really the wrong approach and, and it has proven to be ineffective. But one piece of it, too, that will 
Um, in addition to, uh, you know, if you looking at the impact, and I'll get to that in just a second, like looking at the impacts of due diligence or the effectiveness of due diligence, um, and that is not just about when there's an impact there, but it is the whole prevention, which is, of course, the whole point. But if, if regulators are looking at that, that's going to encourage companies to use those mechanisms and those initiatives and those certification schemes or whatever that give that bring them the expertise. Um, but also if ensuring that auditing companies do fall under the also under the due diligence regulation and having having those having those types of companies also be subject to enforcement to regulatory enforcement and to checks by reg, by by, uh, by regulators um, is also going to be something that brings it you know closes that 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 accountability vacuum that we talked about before um, but if just thinking and and thinking briefly um, and I mean quickly to the Norwegian uh, colleague's question about um, some some companies using uh, different schemes. Joseph, I think. Joseph, oh, yeah. sorry for the intervention. We have five minutes left okay. for the whole thing, so just. Okay, I'll wrap it up right now. Just in that, it's it's of course it is going to be fine and good for for companies to use those kind of uh, you know on, on digitalization or tech that can bring expertise into their own due diligence. But again, it shouldn't be something that I think that a, that a regulator or a consumer authority is sort of pointing to a priori from, oh, this is going to be something that's good for you to, to, to use or not. If you look at the effectiveness, and again, if you, go, if you can take a deep dive into one company, not just when there's an impact there, but if you do sort of these random checks and, and see how a company is doing due diligence, talk to people on the ground in that individual company's uh, situation, you could, you could measure the effectiveness of due diligence even if we're not we're not talking about only reacting to impacts, um, but then doing it that way rather than sort of setting some sort of preset certification uh, hoop that they have to jump through. Well, I'm afraid that we won't be able to fully respond to the other questions that were raised, but you know who the participants were, you know which organizations they work for. You're welcome to keep engaging. We will also download the chat and take a look at the inputs you put there. So you can also put some parting words in there if you would like to share your views. But now, given that we have four minutes left, I will just ask uh, our speakers for one final round of, you started with takeaways at the beginning that you would like people to you know, walk away with. And what's your closing takeaway now that you've heard these exchanges? Let's start with Elspeth. Thank you. So in a minute, I think this is the moment. This is the moment coming in, uh, in terms of due diligence. We've waited a long time, so we need to make this work in practice. It's too late for box ticking. There's no excuses. We're talking about basic workers' rights, human rights, this should happen in practice and we need to make sure this is the case. We need real labour inspections. We need people on the ground who are qualified to undertake these inspections and they need to be taken, um, they need to take place independently and they need to take place um, transparently as well. Social audits as they currently stand, we know they don't always work in practice. This needs to change. And trade unions need to be involved. Trade unions, workers' representatives need to be involved from the start. And let's remember the whole point of this is to improve working conditions on the ground. So let's make sure it happens. Thanks. Thank you. Aruna, would you like to share some words? Yeah, I mean, I would think uh, being regulation ready, sort of preparing and being ahead of the curve is really central right now. And I think you're already uh, sort of regulation ready if you recognize that only investing in systems for or relying or solely using social audits and certifications is going to get you anywhere. I think there needs to be more sophistication to a company's approach on human rights and environmental due diligence. And that sophistication, uh, how that sophistication is arrived is also a sort of an investment and in resources in the company, but also stakeholder engagement. Uh, stakeholders, wherever they are, especially, especially directly affected populations, either through community-based organization, indigenous peoples, unions, etc., they can really inform what is context appropriate, uh, depending on the risk. So put th that should be the sort of uh, two pillars, um, which will keep your regulation ready. And I think you have to also signal your collaboration ready, because you are not going to be there everywhere solely fighting all these uh, human rights abuses alone, you want to partner with other companies. And one way to signal you're open to that partnership, open to uh, also partnerships with civil society and unions, etc., is is to be transparent about your value chain. Know it first, map it, start doing it, get ahead, uh, and then map it and disclose it. Because then other companies that know where you're also present can get in touch proactively and do something to be solutions focused. Thank you, Joseph. One minute, please. Yes, just to say, I'll do less than one minute. Just to say that I think, I mean, it's been a great discussion. I think there were a lot of. Great. I mean, there's obviously a lot of alignment um, around some of the key messages. There is a role for for certification and auditing. Um, it is a piece. 
it's not like, at least I would not argue that we're throwing everything out, but I would argue that there's, we need to put it in the right place. Otherwise, we, we really are risking creating perverse incentives um, that are that is only going to come to the disadvantage of workers and communities. So um, putting it in the right place in due diligence, recognizing where it fits, but not trying to make it be the be all end all is, is uh, really important. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our hope going into this session was that we would end it with a feeling that we could keep going with this discussion for hours. And I certainly feel that way. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to, to more questions. I hope you found it nevertheless valuable. And of course, uh, this is just one piece of the puzzle and one part of the bigger conversation on the role that social auditing and certification play. Uh, I thank you all very much for being here with us. And I also invite you, if you have not looked at the resources, I'm putting it in a chat again, where we had the registration link. This is where you also can see um, the resources that the organizations co-organizing the webinar uh, have put together. And you can see more in there. Thank you very much. And I wish you all a very nice day.